growing up in Edenton, Georgia, I never imagined that a girl like me would be a scientist. <laughs> never. When I say never, I mean never. My love for science began when I was in the fifth grade. That year, I declared that I would be a scientist. And like any self-respecting scientist would do, I walked up to my mother and I said, I need a dissection, scope, a dissection microscope, I need some microscope slides, and even an easy-bake oven for good measure. <laughs> it sounded like an odd combination to her, but once I got my material, I laid them on my dresser and I began work. I went up to my father and I said, I need some work goggles. And I need your old army jacket from a lab coat. <laughs> I put those on and I started growing plants in my room. I grew crystals. I even grew a couple sea monkeys. As I continued to mature in my scientific nature, I began to make dissections. I began to make my own microscope slides. Once I made those microscope slides, my mom said, you're ready. And she began to encourage my STEM growth all the way through college. Once I got to college, I declared that I would be a STEM major yet again. As a STEM major, I noticed one major thing when I walked into the room every day. I would look to my left, and I would look to my right, and I realized that there was no one else really much in the room that kind of looked like me, from the professors and even to the students. In my nine years of higher education, I only had eight. Eight professors that were either women or minorities. In my research, I found that of all STEM degrees awarded each year, only 50% of those are actually awarded to women. 25% of those women actually go on to work in the STEM labor force. Additionally, each year the United States gives 35,000 degrees in science and engineering to black women in the United States. Yet they earn less than 1% of the scientists and engineers in industry. I asked myself, now why is it that? Why is this happening? And I realized through my research that there were several major systemic barriers that were holding these women and minorities back. Those things included racism, sexism, and financial hardship. These women were often considered tokens when they went to work and when they went into the classroom. They were considered tokens because there were so very few of them actually in the classroom and in the lab doing work. As tokens, they were often subjugated to racial and sexual discrimination, which often led to isolation. Now you ask me, let's try to imagine, what does that isolation look like? What does that isolation feel like? So, if you trust me, I'm gonna trust you. We're gonna close our eyes. You're not closing your eyes. <laughs> okay, we're closing our eyes together. I can't close mine, because I might fall, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine? what it feels like to walk into your classroom and be the only one that racially looks like you? Can you further, I heard a yes, thank you. Audience participation. Can you imagine what it feels like to be the only person in the room that is the same gender as you? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Can you imagine what it feels like to be isolated from lab activities, from study groups, by not only your male counterpart, but by your professor as well? Can you imagine what it feels like to have a knot in the bottom of your stomach so very tight that you feel like you can't even raise your hand because if you get that question wrong, someone's gonna question your intelligence and your legitimacy for being in that classroom. That's what it feels like to be a woman in a minority in STEM in the United States and in the world. In my research, I found that Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm here all night, at least for the next five minutes. In my research, I found that women and minorities actually, <clears throat> excuse me, women and minorities actually feel this every day. One of my research participants actually described going to class as a war zone. She stated that she would have to fight mentally, physically, and emotionally every day just to sit next to her classmates. Why is, it, why is that happening? That is happening because women and minorities face additional barriers. Those barriers are inequity in academic resources, lack of funding for graduate school education and research, 
and lack of diversity within the faculty at the university. However, it doesn't have to be this way. We can make a change in academia. Now, what does that look like? That looks like increased funding in the academic sector, especially in our disadvantaged communities. That looks like additional funding for graduate school education, as well as tuition and research opportunities for these students. That looks like diversifying the academic faculty and staff lineup in STEM disciplines. And what do I mean by that? You have to hire, promote, and tenure more diverse faculty and staff in the STEM disciplines. That includes more women, and that includes more minorities. Once you do that, we can change what the face of STEM looks like. What I notice is that academia is not the only place where we must diversify STEM occupations, okay? You must also look at media and consumer intent. Growing up, as you can see behind me, I'm pretty sure, my favorite TV show was Dexter's Laboratory. <laughs> okay, that's how old I am, okay? Dexter's Laboratory is my favorite TV show because, like I said earlier, he was a kid scientist, just like me. <laughs> had a lab coat, and he also had a secret laboratory in his room, okay? However, there was one major difference between Dexter and I, myself. You look at me, you look at Dexter, you can see the difference, right? <laughs> yes. However, because that was my only role model that I had to look at, because there's so very few STEM role models televised on TV, I went with it. However, in a few short 22 years later, a few short 22 years later, there was a hit movie based upon a blockbuster movie, excuse me, not a hit movie based upon a blockbuster movie, but a hit movie based upon a best-selling book at Barnes & Noble called Hidden Figures. That movie, that movie told the story of dynamic women that were really working hard at NASA in mathematics and the STEM arena, science arenas. They were asked to work in these arenas because there was a lack of jobs that needed to be filled. NASA was making history. However, at that time, racism and sexism were at an all-time high. That time is yet here again. On March 29th, 2019, NASA will make history again. NASA will place together its first all-woman spacewalk. I was also inspired by some hidden figures here at the University of Georgia. Those hidden figures were Dr. Whitney Ingram and Dr. Stacy Cobb. Dr. Whitney Ingram was the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in physics in 2016. She joined an elite group of black women in the United States where there are fewer than 100 with physics degrees. Following in her footsteps were Dr. Stacy Cobb. Dr. Stacey Cobb was the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in statistics in 2017 from the University of Georgia. There are very few, very few television shows, movies, and books that are dedicated to diversifying STEM, including more women and minorities. We have to change that. Now you have things such as Legos, women of NASA, highlighting women, women from NASA. You also have things such as Doc McStuffins, who's a child veterinarian. You also have Shuri from Black Panther, who's an engineer. We need more of these women televised so that the students can see themselves in these roles. If more of these women are televised, we can change the face of STEM. For example, about two days ago, I had the first opportunity to watch TV in about six months. As you know, as a doctoral student, you have no time to watch television as much as you try. I actually had a time to sit down with my remote and watch one of my favorite shows, which is Blackish. Okay? On this week's episode, which is a spoiler alert if you have not already watched it, I'm about to tell you about it. A young woman on there, a young African American girl, actually had to move school districts just to get a good STEM education. And after much controversy, they even label her an unhidden figure 
in the school newspaper. We need more televised heroic figures like this on TV shows like Blackish. Because that is the way that you will change STEM. One last secret, parents, friends, community. It's okay for little girls to play with Legos. It's okay for them to play with lab equipment, okay? What we want to do is encourage them to learn, explore, and play. As our students begin to learn, explore, and play, you're gonna foster that scientific spirit. That scientific spirit is what they're gonna need to carry them on to persist when society tells them no, they can't, no, they shouldn't be there. That leads me to my last barrier for women and minorities in STEM disciplines. That barrier is lack of support. Women and minorities need additional support in order to matriculate through STEM disciplines and later STEM careers. That support can be changed at home. They're gonna need our parental support. This parental support will help them to foster a strong science identity. You have to have that science identity as early as elementary school in order to make the connection and the pathway to a STEM career. Parents, educators, everyone in the room, you have to nurture, you have to encourage, you have to inspire our students. Once you do that, they can move forward. For example, growing up, my biggest fans, as I mentioned earlier, were my mom, my dad, my aunts, my uncles, and my teachers. My mom was one of my biggest fans, so much so that every time she packed me up for 4-H camp, space camp, STEM camp, like to read so much, she got her my own library card. My dad was my next second supporter. He was like my first research assistant. We are from the country, as I told you, even from Georgia. We would go outside, we would play, learn, explore until he got tired, and then we would come back in. <laughs> I would describe us as a modern, oh, excuse me, an olden Gen D and Steve Irwin. <laughs> Except we didn't have the money for a television show. Okay? It was interesting. As you can see, my journey to STEM education was never boring, it was always full of excitement always full of support. However, there are many children in this room in America that does not have that support. So I'm asking you as my community, as my TEDx family, to encourage these students to go ahead and pursue STEM occupations. Here's a little bit of data for you. By 2020, which is next year, okay, there is projected to be a 16.5% increase in STEM occupations. What does that look like? Here's another big number. 8.5 million new jobs in STEM, okay? That's roughly the size of New York City, okay? Now the question is, these jobs are gonna be available, but will our students be prepared to fulfill them? So what I'm going to do with you, you're probably asking yourself, what do Legos, microscopes, and Easy Bake Ovens have to do with this? Right? You're asking yourself that question. Yes. Well, what I'm going to tell you or suggest to you is that there are three connectors. There are three connectors in which we can bridge together the opportunity for these women and these minorities to pursue STEM occupations. The first connector is raise awareness. You have to raise awareness for STEM occupations in your local community. I myself work with a local nonprofit called Real Impact. Real Impact is geared towards girls third through eighth grade. I teach lesson plans on neuroscience, biology, we make robots, we go on field trips, I even talk to them about STEM careers. You too can do the same thing in your community. Expose children to STEM camps, expose them to space camps, encourage them to go to museums. I even suggest that you go to elementary schools during career day, especially if you're in a STEM occupation. That way they can see the diversity and the opportunity in STEM. I want you to raise awareness. Connector number two, invest. You have to let your dollar be your vote. Again, we must continue to diversify media and consumer content, television shows, movies, books, all of those great things that bring awareness to STEM to our young minds. If you continue to invest, again, you will change the face of STEM disciplines. For example, 
Recently, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar took some of his very, very wealthy memorabilia from Planet the NBA. He put it up for auction, and he raised money to increase STEM education in a disadvantaged community where he was close to. Steph and Aisha Curry actually just started a STEM scholarship for young girls in their community. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself. I don't have any memorabilia. I don't have millions of dollars. I don't have the coins or the resources. Okay? Me either. But we can start somewhere. Okay? We can start somewhere. I encourage you to donate those school supplies when you walk into our large retail opportunities. Donate money. Donate time to local nonprofits. Every dollar makes a difference. Connector number three. Check your biases, okay? Let's all be honest in here. We all have some biases. We're not willing to talk about them. We're not willing to bring them to fruition or discuss them, right? But you can do this secretly in your home, okay, to check your biases. <laughs> Go on your laptop and check those, all right? So what you're going to do, listen up, take out pens, pads, whatever you need, Evernote, whatever you need to do. And I want you to go to Harvard University. They have a program called Project Implicit. Project Implicit helps you to identify those biases that you're afraid to talk about. And I further challenge you to take the STEM bias test. We can only imagine how I scored, okay? So check those biases. However, once we raise awareness in our communities, we invest and we check our biases, we can bridge together these Legos and make a change. This is going to work. <laughs> I promise you. Just give me two seconds. I'm an engineer. Remember that. <laughs> Don't forget it. Tell your kids. All right. Bam. Look at that. We can bridge together and make a change in STEM occupations. OK? We can include, include more diversity, more women, and more minorities. This will not only change the face of STEM, but it will strengthen the U.S. economy for that workforce in 2020 and prepare our society to move forward in the 21st century. Again, I thank you. Good night. <laughs>